Welcome to the Michael Shermer Show. It's your host, Michael Shermer. This episode is brought to you by Wondrium, a series of college-level audio and video courses and documentaries produced and distributed by The Teaching Company. Wondrium brings you engaging educational content through short-form videos, long-form courses, tutorials, how-to lessons, travelogues, documentaries, and much more, covering every topic you ever wondered about and a bunch you haven't. Like, have you thought of this course here? It's another one I'm going to take. I do maybe one a week or every two weeks of these courses. This one's 24 lectures, 30 minutes a lecture. The Birth of the Modern Mind. The Intellectual History of the 17th and 18th Centuries. Interesting. Here we're talking about Enlightenment and Post-Enlightenment. The New Vision of, the, of Francis Bacon. The New Astronomy and Cosmology. Descartes' Dream of Perfect Knowledge. The Specter of Thomas Hobbes, one of my favorite philosophers. The Newtonian Revolution. Uh, John Locke and the Revolution of Knowledge. Um, oh, here's one. Skepticism and Calvinism. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Oh, I see. It has to do with Pierre Boyle. Interesting. Okay, good. So I'm not going to read all 24 of those. Of course, they deal with, um, Rousseau, the skeptical challenge to optimism, David Hume. Oh boy. Yeah. This one is for sure, uh, going on my short list of courses to take in the coming weeks. That's what I recommend, is that you sign up as a subscription service with Wondrium and get 50% off the first three months. That's half off that first quarter if you sign up through me, my show here, by going to wondrium.com slash Shermer, S-H-E-R-M-E-R, Wondrium, W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M, dot com slash Shermer, 50% off that uh, first three months. It's great. It's a great way to really to use your time as an autodidact. When you're driving, cycling, hiking, walking, doing chores, vacuuming the floor, which I'm going to have to do here in the office shortly. <laughs> so guess what I'll be doing? Listening to a One Dream course. Check it out. OneDream.com slash Shermer. Get that 50% off. All right. Here's our episode. As you know, this is a largely book driven podcast. And so today I have no guest. I'm going to tell you about my own book. My new book just came out. Uh, well, when you're listening to this, we'll be releasing it on the pub date, which is Tuesday, October 25th. For some quirky historical reason, books are always released on Tuesdays. I'm not sure if it's similar to the voting issue or whatever back in the day. But uh, this is my 15th book, depending on how you're counting some of those early ones. But if you begin with uh, Why People Believe Weird Things, Conspiracy is my 15th book. It's subtitled Why the Rational believe the irrational. Now we toyed around with the title and subtitle as publishers and authors I want to do and uh, came up with, you know, just the shortest title we could, Conspiracy, connecting the dots on the cover, which I really love. Some people not only find conspiracy, but also um, CIA is in there and Soros, S-O-R-O-S, and a few others <laughs> found in the vein of patternicity, other patterns in there. Um, but they, the problem uh, uh, to be solved in the book is in the subtitle. Why is it that rational, smart, intelligent, educated people believe the most irrational, ridiculous, untrue conspiracy theories? So that's the problem I, I set out to solve in the book. It is uh, 13 chapters, of course, lucky number 13, plus a coda which uh, presents the results of the scientific study I conducted along with my um, colleagues and collaborators at the Skeptic Research Center. And uh, that's at a coda, so I guess technically it's 14 chapters, but we like 13. Anyway, it comes in three parts. Part one, why people believe conspiracy theories. So part one is about the psychology, sociology, anthropology, behavioral economics, etc., of conspiratorial beliefs, that, that is, who believes conspiracy theories? Why? What even constitutes a conspiracy theory? How do you define a conspiracy theory? What's the difference between a conspiracy and a conspiracy theory? And so forth. Turns out there is a vast, deep, rich literature in scholarship and in social science on conspiracy theories and why people believe them. So I summarize all that, but also add a lot of my own original thoughts and research on the subject, because uh, I've been studying this 
really since probably I was in college as an undergraduate, reading books about, well, the late great planet Earth, this uh, kind of religious conspiracy that the world was going to end, um, to non dare call it treason, and uh, all those kind of um, conspiracy theories uh, uh, in the 70s that I got interested in. At any rate, but uh, in, at Skeptic, we've been studying this really since the very beginning. So you could say for 30 years, I've been uh, reading and writing and researching about this. So, And it's actually good that I didn't write this book until now, until the last couple of years. It took me three years to write it. Because had it come out earlier, we would have missed the whole Pizzagate, QAnon, rigged election, big lie, conspiracy theory, and all the craziness that has gone totally mainstream. So many people in the media I have found over the decades um, think of conspiracy theories as just kind of this goofy, lame, fringed, you know, tinfoil hat wearing belief system. Uh, but it's not. It's never been fringe. It's always been mainstream. It's just been harder to see it that way until it got into the White House. And then we saw what happened on January 6th. That's actually where I begin uh, chapter one uh, or the prologue uh, with that uh, event, that uh, insurrection of people who sought to overturn the United States government uh, based on a false conspiracy theory. And people act on their beliefs, and this is why the truth matters. Anyway, that's the first section, part one, why people believe conspiracy theories. Two, how to determine which conspiracy theories are real. Okay, as I'm going to share with you in a moment, one of my um, tenets of conspiracism is that enough conspiracy theories are true um, that it pays to err on the side of assuming more of them are true than probably are, making more type 1 errors, false positives. Um, So the question then becomes, well, which ones are true? Which ones are not? How do you know? Uh, So riffing off Carl Sagan's baloney detection kit, I created my own conspiracy detection kit. And then, uh, and so I have a dozen different questions you can ask about that. Uh, a, any particular conspiracy theory, and then apply kind of a Bayesian reasoning, you know, update your priors. You start with your priors and then update them with new information and then adjust from there your credence in whether the conspiracy theory is true or false. And then I apply it to the truthers and the birthers and the JFK assassination conspiracy uh, theory to, again, QAnon, the rigged election, and on and on, all the big ones. And, um, and then, and then I actually have, uh, three different chapters on real conspiracy theory. Uh, That is conspiracy theories that turn out to be true. That is real conspiracies. They are rampant. They are historical. They are current. They are deep in the U S government, the CIA. Uh, I have much discussion about CIA's involvement in attempts to overthrow foreign countries, assassinate foreign leaders. Um, dose our own citizens with mind-altering drugs, MK Ultra, uh, Project Paperclip, um, and you know the whole Groom Lake uh, Area 51. I mean, this is just endless uh, activities by the CIA um, without the approval of of Congress, certainly without the knowledge of Congress or the public until just recently. In recent years, these documents were declassified, so now we know what our government agencies were up to in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, even into the 90s, even in the 2000s, as WikiLeaks has exposed in the same way that the Pentagon Papers exposed to what extent the U.S. government in the highest levels was lying to its own citizens about the Vietnam War in this case. Um, And then uh, part three, um, talking to conspiracists and rebuilding trust and truth. So I begin with the premise you've heard me on the show ask a lot of my guests is, how do you talk to a conspiracy theorist? What if you're at uh, Thanksgiving dinner and, you know, uh, weird Uncle Bob, you know, blurts out that the, uh, you know, the the, the 2020 election was rigged uh, or that, um, you know, COVID-19 is is a hoax made up to uh, either concoct vaccines so that big pharma can make a lot of money or to control the world population or for Bill Gates to chip everybody or in conjunction with 5G to, you know, kind of control the masses and information and so on. How do you talk to somebody who thinks that, right? I mean, you can't just say you're an idiot to to believe that. It's not going to work. Because nobody thinks that they are uh, are, pre- are believing something that's false. I mean, if, if it was false, you just wouldn't believe it, right? So people come to 
think that what they believe is actually true. But is it? Okay, well, so part two, uh, you can apply the conspiracy detection kit criteria to that. But in part three, well, what do you say? I mean, what kinds of questions do you ask um, or statements do you make? Really, you just have to ask questions and listen and ask, what's the source of that? Where did you hear that? How reliable is that source? How good is that information? What's the evidence for it? How does it fit with the way the rest of the world works? And so on. The, that criteria from the conspiracy detection kit, you can sort of apply by just asking questions, right? And then, um, and then the final regular chapter, how to rebuild trust in truth, reason, rationality, and empiricism in reality-based communities. This is uh, my assessment of the current problem in society that is kind of a breakdown in trust in the media, in uh, journalism, in science, in the judicial system, in government, in Congress. I mean, nobody trusts anybody anymore. Uh, what are we going to do about that? Because if there's no trust, then we can't have a civil society. So I outlined some steps I think we can take there. And then, as I mentioned in the coda, I present all the original data and findings of the um, Skeptic Research Center study on conspiracy theories and what people believe about them, um, it, which I conducted with uh, my colleagues at the SRC, Skeptic Research Center, uh, Ananda Said and, and Kevin McCaffrey. And uh, so if you're a professional scholar who studies conspiracies, uh, you'll be interested in that chapter. And if you want the raw data, you know, we can share that with you. The book is dedicated to my late partner, who I've mentioned many times on this podcast, who is right above my uh, right shoulder there uh, when we put her on the cover of Skeptic, um, who passed away one a little over a year ago. Uh, so the dedication reads to Pat Lindsay, co-founder of the Skeptic Society and Skeptic Magazine, colleague, confidant, and friend, who embodied the maxim and mission of the Skeptic Society, adopted from the 17th century Dutch philosopher Baruch Spinoza, quote, I have made a ceaseless effort not to ridicule, not to bewail, not to scorn human actions, but to understand them. And I do try to apply that in this book uh, in a rational, um, emotionally neutral way. <clears throat> Because as I said, if you offend people by being disrespectful uh, and you, if you ridicule them, they're not even going to listen to what you have to say. <clears throat> the opening epigram for the book uh, here just next to the table of contents comes from Steven Pinker's latest book, Rationality, What It Is, Why It Seems Scarce, Why It Matters, which came out in 2021. Quote, to understand is not to forgive. We can see why humans steer their reasoning toward conclusions that work to the advantage of themselves or their sex, and why they distinguish a reality in which ideas are true or false from a mythology in which ideas are entertaining or inspirational, without conceding that these are good things. They are not good things. Reality is that which, when you apply motivated or my side or mythological reasoning to it, does not go away. False beliefs about vaccines, public health measures, and climate change threaten the well-being of billions. Conspiracy theories incite terrorism, pogroms, wars, and genocide. A corrosion of standards of truth undermines democracy and clears the ground for tyranny. But for all the vulnerabilities of human reason, our picture of the future need not be a bot tweeting fake news forever. The arc of knowledge is a long one, and it bends toward rationality. Close quote from Stephen Pinker. What a great epigraph and start to the book. Okay, so I will now read from the Apologia at the beginning of the book that explains my approach to the subject in trying to understand conspiracy theories and why people believe them. Many different cognitive, social, political, economic, cultural, and historical factors are involved. So any explanation is necessarily going to be complex and possibly overdetermined. The prologue that follows outlines this volume in more detail, but allow me to briefly sketch my theoretical model of three overarching factors at work. They demonstrate why people believe conspiracy theories with an aim toward illuminating what I am calling the conspiracy effect. Why smart people believe blatantly wrong things 
for apparently rational reasons. 1. Proxy Conspiracism Many conspiracy theories are proxies for a different type of conspiracist truth, a deeper mythic, psychological, or lived experience truth. As such, the details and verisimilitude of particular conspiracy theories are less important than the richer truths represented therein, which often contain self-identifying, existential, and moral meaning, frequently involving power, both for the conspiracist and for the perceived conspirators. 2. Tribal Conspiracism Many conspiracy theories harbor elements of other beliefs, dogmas, and adjacent or preceding conspiracy theories long believed and held as core elements of political, religious, social, or tribal identity. As such, current conspiracy theories, like proxy truths, may serve as stand-ins for earlier ones having deep roots in history. This accounts for the cross-pollination of conspiracy theories and the propensity for people who believe in one to believe in many. An endorsement of these theories serves as a social signal of loyalty to the tribe that embraces them as part of that group's identity. And in this case, for example, with costly signaling theory in application, the goofier, crazier, more insane, ridiculous, irrational, the conspiracy theory that you endorse publicly, the stronger is your tribal loyalty. That's how we ended up with the whole crazy QAnon, Pizzagate, rigged election conspiracy theory that nobody in the GOP believes except for Trump. Anyway, I should say GOP leadership. Apparently the rank and file do believe it. Three, constructive conspiracism. The assumption by most researchers of and commentators on conspiracy theories is that they represent false beliefs, which is why the term has become a pejorative descriptor. As in, that's just a crazy conspiracy theory. This is a mistake because, historically speaking, enough of these theories represent actual conspiracies. Therefore, it pays to err on the side of belief rather than disbelief, just in case. With a lot at stake, especially one's identity, livelihood, or even life, which was the case during the Paleolithic environment in which we evolved our conspiratorial cognition, it is often better to assume that a conspiracy theory is real when it is not, false positive, instead of believing it is not real when it is, a false negative. The former just makes you paranoid, whereas the latter and make you dead. Thus, there is a mismatch between the rational conspiracism of our evolutionary ancestry and the modern world. Filled as the latter is with a myriad of conspiracy theories so widespread and diverse that discerning truth from falsehood can be exceedingly difficult. To this end, I make a distinction between paranoid conspiracy theories involving ultra-secret and uber-powerful entities for which there is little to no evidence, and which are largely driven by paranoia. And realistic conspiracy theories pertaining to normal political institutions and corporate entities that are conspiring to manipulate the system to gain an unfair, immoral, and sometimes illegal advantage over others. That's my definition of a conspiracy. Because both history and current events are brimming with real conspiracies, I contend that conspiracism is a rational response to a dangerous world. Thus, in the common computer analog, it is a feature of, not a bug in, human cognition. The apparently rational reasons in my definition of the conspiracy effect are doing a lot of work. We will explore those reasons in depth in this book. Layered on top of these three overarching factors are a number of additional psychological and sociological forces at work in reinforcing a belief in conspiracy theories. These include motivated reasoning, cognitive dissonance, teleological thinking, transcendental thinking, locus of control, anxiety reduction, confirmation bias, attribution bias, hindsight bias, my side bias, oversimplification of complex problems, patternicity, agenticity, and more. There's a lot of psychological effects going on here at once, interacting with each other in addition to my three different uh, conspiracism um, theoretical constructs. So this takes many chapters to deconstruct all that, and there's a lot of research, really super interesting experiments that I review. 
Finally, because so many conspiracy theories represent real conspiracies, the second part of the book is largely focused on determining their truth or falsity. As such, my more objective scholarly voice in the first half of the volume will be layered with that of my day job as head of an organization, the Skeptic Society, and publisher of a magazine, Skeptic, tasked with opining on the verisimilitude of the claims people make. That is, I'm going to posit that there is a way to determine the truth value of most conspiracy theories, and I will offer my opinion on many of the most popular ones found in both history and today. My approach in this book, as it has been in most of my writing, is that of Charles Darwin, from a comment he made in a letter to a friend who had just informed him that critics have accused him of being too theoretical in his revolutionary 1859 book on the origin of species, and that he should have just put his facts before us and let them rest. Darwin replied, About 30 years ago, there was much talk that geologists ought only to observe and not theorize, and I well remember someone saying that at this rate, a man might as well go into a gravel pit and count the pebbles and describe the colors. How odd it is that anyone should not see that all observation must be for or against some view if it is to be of any service. Close quote from Darwin. I call the final clause of this observation Darwin's dictum, and it bears repeating all observation must be for or against some view if it is to be of any service. So ultimately, although my book is pretty scholarly in nature, it's published by Johns Hopkins University Press, one of the most respected university presses in the world. I really, I can't help but give my opinion. And in fact, following Darwin's dictum, I feel obligated to, and I think other authors should as well. I mean, you can outline what other people should do to decide which conspiracy theories are true or false, but what do you think? Okay, well, I tell you what I think. <laughs> I'm sure JFK was assassinated by a lone gunman named Lee Harvey Oswald, right? And Obama was not born on foreign soil. And um, 9-11 was not an inside job by the Bush administration. Anyway, I spent three different chapters just on those three right there explaining why. Um, but, and not, but not just how to think about conspiracy theories, although I do that, but also what do I think? And I tell you what I think. Um, so that's the book. It's, it's pretty thick. It is what, what are we talking about here? I forgot to even look at my total pagination here all the way to the end of the index at 355 pages. So very respectable. Um, we have a lot of, um, graphs and charts, like here's some of the graphs from the CODA of my research on um, uh, 29 different conspiracy theories and what people believe about them and why. Uh, but also, I'm, I'm grateful to Johns Hopkins University Press, the editors and designers and book production people there for producing such a beautiful book. I mean, I, I'm often commenting about this with other people's books. I am grateful to them that they did so with my book. You know, it's a beautiful binding here, silver and plaque. The dust jacket is really nicely designed and laid out. I won't tell you what I had in mind for a cover because I'm not an artist, so what do I know? So fortunately, they rejected my crazy ideas and came up with this fabulous cover. But the typography, the layout, the design is all really, I mean, it's just beautifully done, easy to read, um, and they used high-quality papers. So the font, so the um, uh, even the, the kind of blurry photographs, like I reprint here uh, the headshot from the Zabruder, uh, from, well, this is frame 247 with uh, the next shot. And then I have a nice um, illustration there that was done by Pat Lindsay, again, my partner above me there, uh, for our special issue of Skeptic on the 50th anniversary of the JFK, showing how the so-called magic bullet wasn't magic at all. It's just the single bullet theory. Uh, and we ex ex explain in great detail exactly how that bullet went uh, through all those different, uh, two different people and all those different body parts. Um, without any magic, supernatural, paranormal, or anything like that uh, going on there. Um, and so, um, and then I have here the headshot uh, from the Zabruder film in which you can, so here's the actual bullet that was supposedly pristine. It's not. So again, nice that we have high quality paper so the photos are clear. And you can actually see right there in the headshot of the brain matter and blood and stuff splattering going up and forward. Not back and to the left, like in Oliver Stone's JFK film, where 
his uh, Jim Garrison character, um, played by Kevin Costner, says, you know, back and to the left, back and to the left. And you, you watch that, and you go, yeah, yeah, there's a shooter in the front. No, no, no. If you actually watch the Zabruder film in high definition, at, in slow-mo, the bullet comes from the back. You can see the brain matter going up and forward as if the shot came from behind and up, which it did by Lee Harvey Oswald in the Texas School Book Depository building. And uh, anyway, that's just a few hints there of, of, of what else is in the book. I'm super proud of this one. I think it is. Uh, I know I say this about all my books, but I really think this is my best one. It's probably the best written one. Hopefully I get better as a writer through practice, and I try to improve my writing, vocabulary, sentence structure, overall narrative flow of the text. But it's also um, a nice, tight, theoretical approach to the problem. Why do people believe conspiracy theories? Um, there's a lot of theories about it, but I think they're uh, lacking in one area or another, so I try to push the frontiers of scholarship and theoretical um, modeling about conspiracy theories. And so hopefully people who study conspiracies professionally can gain something from this, take my ideas and push them further forward. The job is not done, never done in science, of course. So um, anyway, so, but I'm grateful to um, Johns Hopkins for um, having the courage to do this. Conspiracy theories are not that popular. Books about conspiracy theories are not that popular. Sorry, let me rephrase that. Books that are skeptical of conspiracism, which mine is, and for good reason, uh, are not that popular amongst uh, trade uh, publishing houses, much less um, university presses. Yes, of course, they'll publish the, you know, the, the goofy ones that um, claim that, you know, that moon landing was faked or, or um, you know, that 9-11 was an inside job and so on. You can, you can find publishers for those, but... Um, you know, a serious scholarly work that tends to be skeptical of these things. Uh, it's difficult to find publishers interested in that. So I'm really appreciative of Johns Hopkins University Press, who recognized what I recognized um, in, you know, I don't know, maybe 2017, 2018. This conspiracy stuff is getting serious. I mean, it's gone all the way up to the top and it was of the government. And it was clear uh, um, after the 2020 election in November that, um, Trump wasn't going to go away. Uh, he was going to try to to employ his conspiracy theory in great detail with his followers and get them to act on it. And that's exactly what he did. And we now know exactly how that happened through the um, January 6th hearings and all the interviews with all the people uh, involved or adjacent to it. It's clear this is uh, a conspiracy theory run amok in which people act on their beliefs. And so it's evident that conspiracism is not fringe, it's mainstream. And again, because so many conspiracy theories turn out to be true, it's good that it's mainstream, because in a way, again, back to the real ones, you know, if, if, if we didn't have declassification, we didn't have Freedom of Information Act, we wouldn't, and, and, and these congressional hearings, we wouldn't know what the uh, CIA was up to, or the FBI, or the U.S. government. And not just those, those acts, but also whistleblowers, right? I mean, Daniel Ellsberg, um, Edward Snowden, and so forth. It's good that we have these people to tell us what's actually going on behind closed doors. And, you know, one of the things I discuss in the book is um, that people outside of power think people in power have more power than they probably actually have. But without transparency, it's hard to know. And, and so we become suspicious of large corporations, of powerful government agencies, or apparently powerful government agencies. And it turns out often they do do things, nefarious things. Again, you know, I discuss in detail about um, the um, N N Northwoods document that, uh, in which President Kennedy's own people presented him with false flag operations as a pretext to invading Cuba and assassinating Castro. I mean, what? Our government? Yeah. No, to his credit, he didn't act on these things, but that even that people in the top echelon of the U.S. government were conspiring to assassinate foreign leaders and invade countries. Okay, this is serious stuff, right? Anyway, so that's why I'm, I'm pretty proud of the book. I feel like uh, I've made a contribution to an important field that makes a difference. It's part of our larger uh, mission here at the Skeptic Society of, of uh, educational uh, outreach and media outreach about important subjects uh, in our 
wheelhouse of what we do and conspiracy theories is certainly in that. And, uh, and so, yeah, that's it. And so since today is the day that it comes out, I would really appreciate your support by going to Amazon and just order it right there or go to amazon.com or go to audible.com and order the audio book. Um, you just heard me read just two pages from the, um, opening pages of the book, but I read the whole book and, um, yeah, I try to re- not to read too slow so you don't have to speed it up to 1.3 or 1.2, but you can if you like. In any case, I read the whole thing unabridged uh, so you can get it uh, at audible.com or the book at amazon.com or better still, just go to your local bookstore, which I still believe in. We have Chaucer's book here in Santa Barbara that I'm doing a public event at. I try to go in there and purchase books from them when I can because, well, I like bookstores and I think it's good to support bookstores. I know it's easy and convenient to get books through Amazon. I do it all the time. But anyway, in the links to the show notes for this podcast, there'll be a link to Amazon, to Audible, to our webpage, and so on. Um, I would really appreciate your support in purchasing a copy. Also, it's o- late October. It, Christmas is coming up. This is make a great this is make a great Christmas present under the tree wrap for your crazy Uncle Bob who thinks some conspiracy theory or other is, is true when it not, or maybe even if it is, he might enjoy reading this. So, Conspiracy, Why the Rational, Believe the Irrational, my latest book, check it out. Thanks for listening.